experiencing trauma and more people have access to healing. So I just wanted to say that and acknowledge that there's so much racial trauma going on right now and social discord. Um, and we will be having more conversations as part of Better Normal, um, talking about racial equity and racial justice and what that means as part of becoming trauma informed in our communities and in our systems and in our families. Um, but now we're going to talk about the power of discord and I'm just going to introduce um, Claudia and Ed. Um, Ed Tronic, um, PhD, is a developmental neuroscientist and clinical psychologist at the, and university distinguished professor at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. He is chief faculty of the Infant Parent Mental Health Fellowship Program. He's a research associate in the Division of Newborn Medicine at Harvard Medical School. He's the author of five books and more than 450 scientific papers. His current research focuses on behavior, on the behavior and physiology of infants and mothers coping with stress, infant memory for stress and its relation to trauma, epigenetic processes affecting infants and parents' behavior, and the factors leading to relapse in new mothers with opioid use disorder. Thank you very much for being here, Ed. He mm -hmm. and Claudia co-wrote The Power of Discord, and Claudia is a pediatrician, or Dr. Gold, um, I'm being informal, I hope that's okay. Oh, um, fine. please. <laughs> Claudia is a pediatrician and writer. She's practiced general and behavioral pediatrics for more than 20 years and currently specializes in infant parent mental health. She's the author of the developmental, the developmental Science of Early Childhood, The Silenced Child, and Keeping Your Child in Mind. She is a pediatrician, infant family specialist, and the director of the Hello, It's Me project, and she's on the faculty of at the UMass Boston Infant Parent Mental Health Program as well. Her blog is excellent, it's Child in Mind, and it's at her website, which I will add uh, into the comments. And um, I personally had the uh, great fortune of meeting Claudia and one of my first things on my job at ACES Connection, I, she joined a chat, a Parenting with ACES chat, and um, she's one of the most compassionate, hopeful, um, caring, um, experts talking about ACEs and uh, how we can transform the, the way we support parents who are struggling. Um, and I'm very grateful that she's here and I'm grateful that through you, Claudia, um, Ed is here as well so that we can learn from both of you. So I just wanted to say, we're going to talk about today why you two wrote this book, a few of the concepts in the book, and then just how that relates to parenting with ACEs and supporting parents parenting with ACEs. Um, I have really enjoyed reading the book this week. It's excellent. Um, and uh, in the beginning, Claudia, you talked about going from managing to listening and um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, but also why you and why you and Ed are co-writing this together. What what brought you two together to work on this book? Sure. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for arranging this. And it's such a treat to reconnect with you and all these faces, many of whom I know, and the ones who I'm meeting for the first time. Uh, so. My way into this work was as a general and behavioral pediatrician. Um, and over 20 years of practice, um, I came to recognize that the cu current systems of care really serve to uh, silence the voices of uh, children and parents. Um, and in, in a more concrete way, I was uh, referred huge numbers of kids for evaluation of ADHD and bipolar disorder. Um, and there was no space or time to really listen to the story of these children and their families. Um, and then at, at the same time, I began studying with the Berkshire Psychoanalytic Institute. And I was introduced to a completely different way of thinking than I had learned in my medical training. Um, the pediatricians get surprisingly little exposure to the significance of relationships. Um, and these kids who I was seeing they had some really uh, problematic, uh, deep problematic disruptions in relationships early on. Um, 
So I began to use the ideas that I had learned from the likes of Ed <laughs> uh, in my uh, in the um, uh, in the Berkshire Psychoanalytic Institute Scholars Program and others, uh, Winnicott, Fonagy, and I began to see dramatic transformations in families where I had previously experienced a lot of uh, frustration and failure on their part and mine, even though supposedly I was very well educated. Um, and, and so that led to my first book, which was Keeping Your Child in Mind. Um, and then I found out about this field of infant mental health that I had never heard of. Um, and then I, it was recommended that I join the fellowship that Ed is the uh, chief faculty of. So I did that. Uh, and then I had the incredible good fortune to be invited to be on the faculty. Um, and then uh, this very wonderful moment occurred in the August of 2017 when I received an email from Ed saying, <laughs> would you like to write a book together? And so I just have to say that this last three years has been such an extraordinary learning experience because we, we essentially in our relationship represent what the book is about because we had countless moments of mismatch and repair. <laughs> uh, and and I, through that process, I came to really recognize the the profound significance of Ed's work really about much more than parent-infant relationships, um, really about how we are in relation to other people throughout our lifespan and also in our society as a whole. And if you'll forgive me just for another moment, I just want to note that it is not lost on us that we are releasing a book called The Power of Discord at a moment when we are experiencing unprecedented discord in our world. And I think it really, speaks to what we, a way to understand what's going on is that we've, we've had enough of smoothing over uh, brutal systemic racism. We just, we can't smooth it over anymore. We need to get into the discord, we need to get into the mess, and that process will fuel us to make the necessary changes. So I just wanted to say that because we're in it and I, I just felt like I had to name it. So I'll stop talking there and, and <laughs> hand it back to you. <laughs> Great. I mean, I would love to hear um, a little bit from you, Ed, too, about how you two came to work together, but also um, just on the still face paradigm that you talk so much about in the book. Okay, thank you, Allison. Um, well, it really is a pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you. Thanks to both of you for uh, for setting for setting this up. Um, I realized in something that Claudia was saying that um, we actually share a, a little piece of experiential history. Not not the two of us together, but we went through the same kind of thing. Where she said um, that you said you really had to shift your view of what was going on from managing to listening. Um, when I was in graduate school, which was probably about 150 years ago, um, I was studying experimental perception, which is how we visually see the world. And that's probably, at that time, was possibly the most experimental and maybe the most advanced uh, part of psychology. Um, uh, and so I was studying developmental perception and um, I was studying what we would now call neurosciences, but it was at that time brain and physiologic development. And so I wanted to do a study on visual perception, um, addressing the, the nature and nurture controversy. And I had the opportunity to um, to go to Harlow's laboratory at the University of Wisconsin, where I was going to study infant monkeys. So you can see right away that I've always had this devotion to really small, small little organisms. Um, that study never worked out. But while I was there, this was the period of time, this was the mid 60s, that um, the work, the initial work on uh, uh, surrogate mothers and deprivation had really begun to take hold. And um, the whole laboratory was really focused on social emotional development. 
But of course, I knew that that really wasn't important um, because I was studying perception and that was the most important thing. Um, and perception actually addresses a question that um, I now see as uh, something that I've come to in a very different kind of way. And the question is, how do we, how do we see the world? How do we make sense of it? Um, and what I now talk about is how do we make meaning about the world? So the, the radical shift in, um, for me was I, I came to um, Harvard after I got my, my doctorate and was in the Center for Cognitive Studies. Uh, and I met this person, uh, Barry Brazelton. And one of the things that we did, Barry, myself, uh, Patty Greenfield, who's at UCLA and studies cultural differences, was we all worked on an infant daycare center. And my task in the infant daycare center, or this and young children, was to develop a curriculum for the daycare center so that it would be educational. Um, and of course, I was really prepared for that because I knew everything there was to know about development. Um, I had all this experimental background. I studied visual perception, studied the development of perception. And probably in the first two or three weeks that I was at the infant center, at the infant center, which by the way was a community center and lasted for pretty much 25, 30 years in Boston, um, I realized I knew almost nothing about infants and infant development. And of course, it was the influence of Barry Brazelton, who was saying, we really need to look at social, emotional development. And I guess with that switch in my sense of what was really important, um, I, uh, I started studying social emotional development. I had one of my professors from University of Wisconsin uh, who came up to me and like the scene from The Graduate, put his hand on my shoulder and he said, Ed, don't do this social stuff. Go back to perception. You know, if you remember the plastics metaphor. Um, but I stuck with it and the still face came about as a very simple-minded experiment where I wanted to show that the infants were, and this will not surprise anyone now, but at that time it was pretty surprising, that the infants were really active and socially responsible to emotional communications and social communications. And I was, having been trained as an experimentalist, I wanted to figure out a way to do it. And it seemed like one way to do it, which would sort of be um, a really extreme way, would be simply to have the mothers not respond to the infants. And if the infants were in fact responsive to the mothers, if they had some kind of expectations about what was going on, if what the mother was doing meant something to them, then they would have a reaction to it. Um, and that's exactly what happened. It happened with the very first baby we saw. We saw the, the still face effect happen with the second one, the third one. Um, and I guess I've been pretty much studying it ever since. And in working with Claudia, what I've come to see is in a way the the still face paradigm is a bit of an, a, high, a highlighting of the match, mismatch, and repair process. Because you have the mother and infant playing with one another. You then create this really, this, this mismatch with the mother not doing anything. And then um, you watch them renegotiate what's going on and repair what's going on. So in some sense, it's, it's become kind of a canonical form or a canonical version of the mismatch work that, um, that Claudia and I have really, really focused on. 
And I wanted to ask, I mean, I think what was really interesting, I know at least for me when I first saw the still face experiment, and I will be putting a link in there too if anyone wants to watch it again or hasn't hasn't seen it, um, I'll put a link in the chat. But when I first saw it, I really understood it to be important to show um, what can happen when there's disruptions in attachment or connection. And one of the things I was hoping it, the, you know, the, the Power of Discord is a really hopeful book. And I think one of the um, things that you both emphasized in this um, that I got out of it was that we focus a lot on mismatch and not as much on repair. And you do talk about ACEs and adversity. You talk about Discord, um, but you don't talk about trauma as much. You talk about repair um and i guess i would just want to ask um how much of that was deliberate to be focusing on the repair um mm -hmm. and the way that the still face is showing a child like really adaptively trying to engage i guess if you if, if either well, of you or both of you i i, I think it's a, a really good question in studying normal development the typical face-to-face -face interactions. When we first started, we being Barry Brazelton, Colin Trevarthen, we all talked about the interaction as being highly synchronous, really positive. We referred to it as a dance, and the dance we typically referred to was Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, which of course, nobody in the world could possibly dance the way they did. And, you know, of course they, did their dancing um, after they had rehearsed it forever and ever and ever. And when I looked at the, and, and, and just let me say, as a sort of aspect of our experience as scientists, um, is that we came in, Barry Brasselton and I, Barry Brasselton, who was probably the greatest observer of babies ever, um, we came into it thinking that it would be synchronous, that it would be this dance. And so we're looking at interactions where everyone else in this, you know, uh, video uh, knows the interactions don't always go smooth. All we did was emphasize how perfect they were, how reciprocal they were. We were really captured by the really positive interactions that you see between infants and adults and infants and parents. And it wasn't until I actually analyzed data that I realized that most of the time, on average, about 70% of the time, the infant and the adult are not in matching states. They're not synchronous with one another. So they're not mutually smiling. They're not mutually gazing. They're disengaged. And then what they do is they come back and they repair the interaction. And I want to be clear that both the adult and the infant engage in repairs. It's not a simple one-way street. But what the repair does is a lot of things. You, you talk about it breaking the connection. You, you've broken the connection in a micro kind of way with the mismatch, and then you get back together again. Um, you also, come to learn if you're the infant or the adult that we can go from a negative state of mismatch into a positive state um, so that I don't have to get stuck in the negative affect and the problems of having you know negative emotions. I come to know that those things can really rapidly change. It also gives the infant a really powerful sense of self um, that I can do this. And more importantly, I think in terms of attachment relationships, it gives the infant a sense of we can do this together. So the relationship starts to take on its own very unique, or not very, it takes on its own unique qualities that relate to how they're working with one another. So for me, when I'm looking at interactions, I expect them to be 
the term we use is messy, mismatching going on a lot of the time. And the really critical event is how well the pair is able to repair that mismatch and that messiness. Because I think that's one of the more powerful forces in development and in terms of building relationships. And Claudia, you you talked you talked about um, even when there is a lot of mismatch, including um, more big disruptions, that um, being able to help parents understand the cause of the mismatch has caused healing. I guess I was hoping you could talk a little bit about that too. How understanding the cause of the mismatch helps the repair. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's actually the process of experiencing the mismatch to the repair in real time. Um, and I think I, I want to sort of land on that word hope um, that you alluded to uh, earlier when you introduced me um, and how, um, you know, when, when people first see the still face uh, experiment, typically they have the same reaction that you did, that they look at the, um, uh, the loss. Um, and then, you know, by immersing myself in this work, I began to see it really as the, the hopefulness of the baby, the sense of agency, and that that actually arises out of working through the mismatches. So, so I, I, you know, it's, I think it's not so much sort of intellectually understanding the cause, like I'm going to explain this, but really kind of seeing, you know, what I would do in my work is, is a family, you know, a, fam a mom would be really, really distraught and the, ba the child would be angry and people would have, it was a state of, of really very difficult, prolonged mismatch in, in the language now that I, I would use uh, from Ed. Um, and then by kind of taking time to listen, listen to the parent generally, uh, and be curious about what was their experience, then that gave them the kind of space in their own mind to be curious about what was going on for their child. And then they would have, they would reconnect with each other. So, and there was, it was very, very moving. Um, you know, I would often have these experiences, well still have these experiences of, of like, you know, tingling in my arms and my eyes would tear up and it was really, going through the mess <laughs> to the other side to, to create that connection. So I was kind of having this over and over again in my own clinical experience. And I have to say also in my own life, you know, I have two young adult children and believe me, have been through many moments of mismatch and repair, but began to recognize that when you actually go through it and it's tough and it's difficult, but you stay in it to get to that point where you reconnect that that is, really uh, kind of an exhilarating moment. And so that's kind of the clinical parallel to, you know, what we talk about in the book about the, the mismatch repair process providing the fuel for growth. Yeah, I, I would just, I would emphasize or add, add to it that if you think about the messiness of interactions, one of the possibilities when you repair them is that you repair it in a unique way. You repair it in a way that hasn't existed before. And it's by having the messiness, by having the variation, the, dis the discord, that out of that discord, you can create, you can co-create something new. Interactions, be they positive or negative, which are highly constricted and highly constrained, don't change. They stay very much the same. So on the negative side, when you have interactions that look really problematic, I think if you look at them really carefully, what you'll see is that in fact, it, it's just a repetition over time of the same kinds of problems that are going on. And it's a perfect dance in a sense but it's all in the negative domain. And so one of the therapeutic things that I think about in working with parents who 
have those problematic kinds of interactions with their infants, um, that you need to disrupt that process. You need to introduce messiness so that you can find something else to take hold of and change. Um, and an example that Claudia and I have talked about quite a bit is an example of this wonderful little girl who is about 30 months of old, 30 months of age, and her mother interacting. And um, maybe some of you have experienced it. This was a mother and an infant, a child, toddler, where they could complete each other's sentences. You know, the mother would start to say something and the little girl would pick up on it. And there were none of, it was, it was an amazing dance. Um, and then when we asked the mother to hold the still face, this little girl just came apart. She was really, really distressed. And it was hard for me to understand it at first, but I think what was happening was that in fact, this mother and her little girl were so in tune with one another that the little girl really had very little experience in repairing interactions. Of course she had some, but the mother and daughter really worked together so well that she didn't have the experience of repair and she didn't know what to do with this break in the interaction and she had really few resources for dealing with it. So I think one of the things that comes out of reparation is resilience. Resilience grows out of the sort of everyday mismatches that are going on, but they give you the capacity and the coping skills to deal with something that perhaps is more extreme. And, and I wanna go back also to your word, um, the cause, because I think it's uh, in the book, we have a clinical vignette that follows that story of the research finding um, and where, and that draws on, you know, a, a composite of uh, clinical experiences with a similar kind of situation where a mom is, you know, the, what we call the too good mother. We're gonna talk later about the good enough mother and the importance of, of having room for, for the mistakes. Um, but in situations like that, where, where you have a, an anxious mom kind of who feels that they have to meet their child's needs at every moment. Um, and then that, that doesn't give the child the space um, to grow into themselves. And so I, I tell the story, we tell the story of a situation like that, which where it was kind of idyllic in infancy. And then as soon as the child became a toddler and was beginning to assert themselves, there was tantrum after tantrum after tantrum. And as we listen to the story, and so I think I like to use the phrase listening to the story rather than necessarily finding out the cause because finding meaning in what's going on. So one meaning was that this uh, mom had been uh, had been quite sick when the baby was born. And so there had been a prolonged separation. Um, and so she had this tremendous feeling of guilt, which led her to feel the need to meet her child's every need at every second. But it was actually it turned out to be much more complicated than that because she also had a mother who gave up everything in her life to raise her children and was very uh, kind of there to meet her need at every second in a way that she experienced as stifling. So there were these kind of layers of meaning to her experience with her child. And once we could listen to the story and, and open up a space for being curious about what was going on for her child, then, then like, you know, having a meltdown when she went out with her friends, you know, that was more okay with her. She, she gave, she opened up a more space for the mismatch and, and repair because there had been no space for that. And, and then the child became, began to, the behavior problems that had been the presenting issue began to just subside without us addressing them really concretely at all in, in, in terms of behavior management or anything like that. Allison, did you want to share any of the um, 
the chat before I ask another question or I see there's lots and lots. There's so much. So um, let me, um, I think let me call on Gail. I feel like Gail, you've had a lot of good comments. Let me, um, let me unmute you. Well, I actually was hoping you would call Robin because I think Robin's, um, hi Robin, I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> going back and forth just about what but but I will say my part as a parent um uh I have an older child but I think about the heroes of those parents that are there right now some of you probably are those parents that are having to multitask in the age of COVID being at home working from home and then having children that want your attention that need your attention that need to be schooled and those that that um that 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 we are uber, uber multitasking right now and just hearing you you thank you speakers so much for speaking um thinking about the repairs that are are needed and for us as parents just being compassionate with ourselves that this we are being asked huge i mean uh, herculean tasks and again i don't have young children um, but those folks that ought, do have young children, these Herculean tasks, being compassionate with ourselves, but then also being able to um, to, make, to to do that repair with with our kids. And then Robin, um, if you want to say some, because I think there's a whole other issue with um, with uh, kids around schools. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. I am so inspired to be listening today, Dr. Tronic. You are one of my biggest heroes I do I the, the still face I share with my school nursing students uh, every time I watch it I it just moves me it disturbs me and it gives me hope too and dr. gold I'm, I follow you on Twitter I'm a big fan um, I so I'm a school nurse and um, see this is like what it is working at home right I'm, I'm working at home and all the sudden all this noise is going on in the background and this is exactly what's happening for everybody um, so I'm gonna try not to yell at my husband who is doing some work downstairs but anyway <laughs> um, but it shows what exactly what this is about right this yeah. is in this moment um, but I look at school as a, commu a, a family community and the and what's happening for us now I'm, I'm very concerned about the repair that's going to be needed before any kind of learning can happen when we all return whenever that may be because we don't know it's still very up in the air and um, so this is so helpful to hear what is right what is it's really hard um, so anyway I I wanted to bring up that whole issue of of the idea of the mismatch of what's happened with COVID and re returning to school yeah. and how co-create something a, a better normal I'm, I'm not so so sure exactly how to respond to that but um, taking the question that Gail raised about repairs I think one of the most important things that we can all do for the families that we're working with um, or that Sissy and Alyssa, Allison are trying to educate is to give them a pass on all the messiness and the mismatches that occur. And, but it's more than just saying, oh, you screwed up and that's okay. It's really that the messiness that, we're, that we argue for is where new things can come about new connections, new ways of being together. We're probably all discovering new ways to be with our partners, with our kids, and as opposed to the dance that we all knew before this came into place. And I think speaking of community is, um, I've, always, I've always said I needed a lot of, rem a lot of scaffolding. My first introduction to child development was as the teaching assistant for Yuri Bronfenbrenner when he was developing his ecological 
model. Um, he was just a fabulous. He was a remarkable teacher. And his ideas about the ecology of families and communities is really critical. And I think from a micro level, if you move to the macro level, is what communities do for parents at home, in schools and the like, is that they, oper they operate as scaffolds for the parents. They operate, the school operates as a scaffold, as a structure for the child, not a constricting structure, because again, they too have messiness in terms of what's going on. So we're gonna have to go back when, when everybody returns to school um, and the kids return to school. One is that a lot of the organization that you establish during this period of time is going to come in part. So you're gonna have a new period of disorganization. It may feel very familiar. And one of the, I think, problematic aspects of that or danger of that would be, in fact, you go back to the way you danced before. But in fact, or hopefully, what we can do is figure out new ways to be together. Maybe parents will be more involved in the school, more involved with their, with their kids. Maybe the kids will be more involved with, with one another. I don't know what it will look like. This, you know, this model isn't a, a predictive model, but out of the stress that we're experiencing now, if, we, if we're able to operate within it and overcome it, then when things change, we, we will have hopefully more positive directions to move in. Um, because I think the ones we've moved into right now are very are really constricting and difficult to take hold of. So I feel like uh, Gail and Robin sort of framed the micro and the macro so beautifully. Um, and I think uh, when we we live in a time where things can feel so overwhelmingly hopeless, <laughs> and that can make us shut down, so that we can't get to those kind of creative solutions. So I think one thing I've really gotten in doing this work with Ed is this idea of moment to moment meaning making and uh, just making that very concrete. So I have grown children, although my, my young adult uh, son who just graduated from college lives at home. And you know, it, to suddenly have your life derailed, whatever you were gonna do is not an option. You have to work at night stocking grocery shelves. You know, these are tough times for, for er at every stage of development. And I, you know, when we go through and with young child, however, a young child, however old our kids are, think of how much opportunity there is for repair because there's so much mess. <laughs> it's like, wow, <laughs> we're gonna do a lot of growing. <laughs> and it, it's tough, but I think that is by staying sort of in the moment, okay, I'm, I'm, I mean, this is very dark, this is very difficult, I feel totally overwhelmed. How can I, in relation with another person, find myself to a more calm and connected state? And then if we just do that moment by moment, that will lead us to be able to have these more macro solutions because we'll have access to our, our higher level thinking processes. Well, if, oh, if, I can, if, if it's okay to, to continue, continue on that, one of the things to think about in terms of the messiness and what we're all experiencing um, right now and trying to cope with and trying to deal with it is that when there's a mismatch, not only is there stress, but from a sort of a systems perspective, the kind of perspective that I learned from Yuri Bronfen, Bronfenbrenner and from um, Lou Sander uh, in particular, that that disorganization that we feel, and probably many of us are feeling a lot of disorganization, and Barry Brazelton talked about disorganization, 
that disorganization leads to uh, an anxiety about one's own ability to be coherent and to hold things together. It's not the psychoanalytic issues. It's the issue that when you're when change is demanded, or when you're things are messy and they're getting messier, one of the ways people deal with it is to constrict, to shrink, to become defensive, to become very rigid, because what it does for them is it allows them to hold on to the organization that they have. And I my bet is a lot of parents and certainly a lot of people in the political realm are, you know, under the pressure of all the protests. There's going to be a whole cadre, a whole community of people who are going to shut down even more and become more constricted. And they're doing it to preserve the organization that they have rather than allowing the rather than allowing the messiness but this comes back to robin's question about the macro if the macro can hold the individuals in their messiness in their disorganization then they're more likely to be able to move forward and be flexible about finding different solutions to things rather than rigidly holding on to what they have. Um, and I think we're going to come to that bifurcation point if we haven't already come upon it. Um, you know, the uh, I'm not a sociologist, so this is just my opinion. But the, the police dealing with protesters in particularly harsh kinds of ways represents a way of holding on to the coherence that you have rather than what else is happening with other police in, uh, in different places is letting, letting the messiness grow and letting it happen and not being terrorized by the messiness and seeing what comes out of it. And I think when that happens, we see really positive things coming out. But again, I deal with babies. Babies are complicated enough, and parenting is complicated enough. So you can take that as, as you will. I was just gonna follow up on that. I think for anyone that's had the messiness be trauma or so life-threatening or so difficult that, that the messiness becomes the thing we shrink from, even if it is the you know, that's one of the things I really appreciated about your book is you really laid out and, and helped, uh, at least me for a reader, understand sort of basic things I've heard about all my life, but didn't totally understand about, okay, to get, to learn self-regulation, you have to have been co-regulated with as a child. And then it doesn't mean it has to go perfectly and synchronistically all the time, but there has to be some co-regulation you've had that experience so then you actually come to count on it expect it um and and carry that within you that that's possible and i felt like you you both did a really good job of laying out how that gets disrupted and can stay disrupted and how of course you know in no way justifying trauma but saying it's not just the trauma that does that lengthy uh troublesomeness in adult relationships it's the lack of there being a repair or even knowing how to repair or trusting that repair is possible and i, and I thought you both did a really a, a really great job at making that make sense but i did want to talk about just because so many people here are working with families that have a lot of aces or are parenting with aces is how do you support parents who maybe are coming to parenting knowing even outside of a pandemic, just overwhelmed because maybe realizing while parenting that I don't really know what good enough, I maybe didn't have good enough parenting and I maybe don't know how to provide good enough parenting. And I'm realizing that 
while parenting, <laughs> you know, like, mm -hmm. so needing to do the healing, but also while being a parent. So how, mm -hmm. I guess, how do you become, you know, a good enough, a good enough parent? How do we help others and ourselves? Um, well, I mean, one of my favorite chapters in the book was called Healing in a Mosaic of Moments Over Time. Uh, and I, I remember exactly when Ed said, we need to have this chapter. And it was some very convoluted phrase. And I was like, no, we can't possibly put that in a book. But, but anyway, we came up with this phrase because I think... I am, I am an academic, remember. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a great moment of meeting. Because I, I remember literally sitting on the lawn at Tanglewood going, how are we going to do this? But we did it, I think. And I think the idea is that if, if the way we are in the world as parents and in every way emerges through what were problematic relationships um, in, in our early development, which is what you're talking about with parenting with ACEs. Um, and then we, it's through, it's not like there's a, not a unidimensional solution. And I think the problem that I came up against in my practice would be a lot of kind of uh, prescriptive, uh, you should do this and this will make you a better parent if you use this, this and this. Whereas it's really got to be a lot of different things. Um, and a lot of, so if you can kind of immerse yourself in a bunch of relationships like these, I mean, sort of this is an example. Here we are on this screen together in a newly messy way of relating because we're not in the same room. Um, but, uh, you know, that's one way, uh, perhaps with your own personal therapist, uh, working uh, with your child because you know, and this is something we talk about a lot in the book, which is that each child brings their own qualities to the relationship. Um, so you're coming with the stuff that happened to you and who you are, and then here comes this unique person. So it's not like it's anybody's fault. It's just, it's just each person contributes their piece to the relationship. And when parenting is difficult, uh, it's, it's out of whack. And, and so in, in this sort of new relational milieu, <laughs> then you learn new ways uh, of relating to with your child and with others in your environment. So, so the, 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 the simple answer is you, you need to do a lot of things. <laughs> like, um, you know, very concretely, like uh, martial arts. You know, I, I often send my families to do uh, family martial arts, moving together, um, being with your friends, being in relation to friends, communities that you make in yoga, uh, so there, there's it just being creative in, in uh, new ways of, of being in relation with others. I, I'd, I'd like to, again, pick up on w one of the themes. And Sissy, you've asked this about trauma before. My particular view um, about trauma is while admitting that there are really traumatic events, but we also know for the most part that when there's a singular traumatic event, like a car accident, where someone you know, has some kind of physical injury and even life-threatening kind of physical injury, for the most part, individuals recover from those kinds of things, especially if they're in supportive environments. When we start talking about trauma-informed education or whatever, one of the things I think about that is we, because of the way we as clinicians, as educators, as people working with families, see the world is we tend to categorize it. So we talk about a child who was abused or in the ACEs, a child who was shamed um, or a child who uh, was neglected and told he or she was in love. Those may or may not be traumatic events. I think we, we have a lot of issues about figuring out exactly what we mean by trauma. But those events um, are a form or a highlight, a peak of disrupted parenting that we then label as the critical event. But the phenomenon is that when there's physical abuse, when there's sexual abuse, when there's shaming, um, 
when there's being told you're unloved, that you never should have been born, I am willing to bet, and I will bet everyone here, that the daily, quotidian, ongoing experiences that the child had with the parents was disrupted almost all of the time. The child becomes, someone said, the child doesn't have a secure base. The child is afraid, or the child is ashamed, or the parents are failing to repair the interactions, where the parents don't allow messiness to occur. And then in that context, the child gets hit. Or the parent screams at the child and gets really angry. But what is the real, I think, what the really toxic, toxic aspect of that is not these peak events that we get focused on, but the problems that the child has all the time. And I, I, some of you may have seen this. I was at this conference, I was at a conference with Bessel van der Kolk, and he was doing a theater performance with a young woman who had, had, um, had been raped when she was probably about 20. Um, as soon as she started talking about this, she was going back to talking about how her father was. Um, she was Chinese American. She talked and had been first raised till she was six years of age in Taiwan. And then she began to talk about how the kids in school taught her. So she was in a situation for much of her life where she was experiencing mismatches and distress really on a chronic, ongoing kind of basis. She was, she was doing actually, she had, in terms of hope, she was functioning remarkably well. Um, and in part because I think she really overcame and repaired much of what she experienced. So to, pu to put it in a nutshell, I think it's the moment by moment as Claudia talks about it, it's the everyday, the ongoing, and in that context, if something big happens, it really lights you up. But the real problem is that those bad things happen because it's pretty bad all the time. And you get wired and you get, um, you know, in, uh, when we talk about seizures, we talk about kindling effects. You're walking around smoldering and then something really big happens. Um, and you don't have the resources to deal with. Um, and so I would like to see some, and I don't know what it would be, some kind of reframing when we talk about trauma-informed therapy to what Bessel van der Kolk's been trying to do in terms of developmental trauma. And I don't know that the word trauma is right, but the idea that it's developmental, it's ongoing, it's a process. And not all of it is quote unquote traumatic. It's just compromising. Well, if I could step in here, because um, you you said the word um, resources, and um, and uh, it just kind of made me think of you know my own household. The resources that were missing were the socioeconomic resources. My parents couldn't attune because we didn't. She didn't have my. We didn't have the money to attune. They were you know they were always at work, and. Um, and Be Bessel and I talked about this for a little bit before um, the webinar we did a few weeks ago, um, which is that the income disparities in the United States are so vast. So many families are facing chronic stress as a result of their socioeconomic status. And I just wonder if you have any comments on that, because it's, uh, it's really showing itself to us this week, especially. Um, not enough families, you know, have the resources that they need in the United States to be I to parents. For a long time, I've, I've been dissatisfied with the idea of risk factors, that you had risk factors and then later on in development, you know, so infants have risk factors and then when they're 10 years of age, they have some kind of problems. The reconceptualization that I've done is in terms of resources and it's the, the word that I use. I think what we commonly call those risk factors, like 
lack of income, lack of time, lack of health care, all of those things, and down the list, all of those things use up or deplete resources that individuals have, both the parents and the child, deplete resources that should be used for fostering growth and development. For the child who's constantly under some kind of stress, be it from the parents or wherever it is, they're using up resources for growth and development. And so their growth and development gets compromised in particular kinds of ways. And for the parents who don't have resources, um, who don't have enough income, have to work three jobs, are fatigued and tired, they're fatigued and tired. They no longer have resources to bring into being with their child. And I think a resource depletion model is one that would really, one is it removes judgment and the categories we get into. And it would really focus on what is it that we need to give people the resources, psychological, emotional, what kind of resources did they, what kind of scaffolding do they need? Um, what kind of environment do they need to be in, in order to be able to have resources and to be with their kids and for their kids to be getting, being allowed to be curious and to develop. I think once you have that, most of the time things take care of themselves. Um, but if you're always worried, if you're always anxious, if you're always under some kind of stress, then you are using resources that you could be using for being with your child, being a good parent, being a good partner. You're using resources just to keep yourself together and to deal with external and difficult events. There, there's a beautiful book and I, I called Heartland about uh, poverty in, in rural America. And I actually have a blog post about this. But what she captures so beautifully how poverty translates into her as a child having no access to a sense that her mother loves her. That, that that's to her what it felt like. And it was, you know, kind of the chaos and she lost her dolly and nobody was paying attention. And, and but, but so it's, it becomes, like Ed is saying, it's, it's a, it depletes the resources of the caregiver to be in those moments of, of messiness and to, to develop that, that, you know, that core sense of hopefulness. Um, so, it, you know, certainly as, a pediatrician, I can't do anything about poverty on a macro level, but I think by devoting resources as a society to supporting parents and very young infants um, so that parents can have the emotional energy to be in the mess with their child, you know, that, that really is where the foundation of a healthy society comes from. Well, I think we're going to have to have a follow up, Allison, on <laughs> because I know we're past four and I can't believe um, I can't believe how quickly this has gone. I am going to share a blog post and I'm going to share some quotes from the book and some resources um, and I will put that on ACES Connection um, probably Monday, but that will be up um, and I think this video will be available as well. Um, so. Uh, I think there was some asking in the chat if it was available and it will be available. And I just, I really wanna thank you both for being here with us, but I wanna thank everybody who's here and has commented also. Um, I, I'm very grateful and I'm looking forward to um, reading all the comments in the chat too, as we're winding up. So we can, um, I know this one has gone a little bit over and that's, that is okay. Of course, if you can't stay, we understand, but, um, um, Sissy, we can we can um, get some concluding remarks from our panelists. Um, you know, we can we can take a couple minutes. Yeah. Okay, great. Would you either both either of you like to say anything about um, about the book or anything you were hoping to talk about today in our in our concluding moments? You want me to go first? <laughs> you always have better things to say. <laughs> 
Well, one thing that we didn't really talk about was uh, the, the idea of the good enough mother. Um, and I think what's, you know, I was very much influenced by Winnicott who had this very unique experience of taking care of kids, parents and babies in real time and then being a psychoanalyst where he listened to these stories of his adult patients who were in a sense regressed to being babies, but they could talk about what, what they were experiencing. And, and he saw that it's really that, and I've said this earlier, that, that it's the, um, the, the, the not knowing and the, the errors or what he actually calls failures, which is kind of a harsh word, but um, is really essential. And I think it was, it was amazing to me kind of to see in my uh, devotion to Winnicott, how when I learned about Ed's work, how much uh, I, I see it as kind of the research that Ed has done over the decades uh, confirms the clinical findings of Winnicott. So, so it, it's just been, uh, I just wanted to kind of highlight that idea of the good enough mother uh, as, a, as a hopeful way to think about ourselves uh, in the world and as parents. And I would like to say in terms of what the, the idea that Claudia brought up and about hopefulness and what Sissy asked about um, in terms of what do you do when things really are problematic and they may have a very problematic history. Um, I think what the, the model that, that we have in terms of mismatch and repair and matching and, and the really powerful experiential internalized effects that come out of it um, is that if you can engage, if you can get the individuals to engage with one another, to achieve matches, or I talk about this esoteric concept of dyadic states of consciousness, where you're really sharing meaning and really sharing feeling that those, that being able to do that allows for repair of, of the history that you're bringing. It gives you new ways, new co-creative ways of doing it. So in terms of Allison's question, like people finding financial support allows them now to engage with one another. So the relationships may have been problematic, but if we as clinicians, providers, educators can scaffold those people to allow them to experience some of the messiness and to support them because it's frightening to be in the messiness. It's distressing to go in and say, oh, we really need to change. But if we can serve as the scaffold for them, and maybe the educational system can then scaff scaffold the community, then we can engage in the messiness and we can find new ways to be together. And so I think really whatever the history is, that this kind of process of discord and repair of it is at the heart of really changing what's possible. And what we need is, in some sense, is the will and the resources to give people the support and the scaffolding that they need. And right now, we're not doing that. We don't give that to people. Um, I used to do, I'll finish very quickly, but I used to, I could do it here and you don't have to raise your hands, but I used to ask people, how many of you have been in therapy? You know, and, and an audience and, you know, two thirds of the audience <laughs> would maybe more would raise their hands. And I'd say, how many of you um, were in therapy, um, say more than twice a month? And you know, all the hands go up because we all were there. And how many of you were in therapy more than 50 times and all the hands stay up? And I say, okay, now think of like what Allison was talking about. Think about the family who's been without resources, for 10 years and they've struggled and they've been dealing with the stress or whatever, how much quote unquote 
therapy, how much scaffolding do they need to overcome everything they put into place to make it adaptive, maybe problematically adaptive, but they did survive and they did keep going. Um, but we want them to experience something else and we want them to have experiences with something else. Twice a month is not going to do it. You know, um, we were all neurotic. You know, I had plenty of therapy and I was plenty neurotic and I still am plenty neurotic. But the therapy helped me. But what about people who have, quote unquote, really serious issues? How much input and scaffolding do they need? And I think they need the process of experiencing with others in the relationship. You know, we talk about therapy as relationship. In the relationship, they need to have that experience of failure, that experience of mismatch, and that experience of repair. Because out of that comes the hope and the possibility of change. Sorry. I... No, that was wonderful. Thank you. And I was, I was just going to say, and I think, you know, you both in the beginning of the book made that argument that we, I, I know Donna Jackson Nakazawa often says we ask the most of the parents who have the least. We give the least to the parents. Uh, we give the most to the parents who have the most, and we ask the most of the parents who have the least. And it's, um, it's such a struggle. And I think, um, but Claudia, one of the things that I, I love about your work is you're listening to parents. So it's not like you're coming in as a pediatrician. And I think you, you both in the book made such a great case for saying we need to listen to what parents are struggling with and what parents are having challenges with and listen to that before we go into managing and, prescript and being prescriptive. So I just, I, I just wanted to thank you both. I mean, it's a very positive and uplifting book um, and you make an excellent case for, for why the, to embrace the mess. And I think you, it's a really successfully done and I'm very grateful that you both are here today, but also just for, the, for your life's work. I know you've both been doing this work for decades and we're very honored that you came and joined us today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Sissy, for putting this together and bringing Claudia and Ed um, to the ACES community. This is this is such a gift. Um, thank you all for being here. I kind of loved seeing everyone raise their hand. Raise your hand if you got some sort of new insight today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, whoo. Um, so um, it was so fun to, to um, see everyone. Thank you for inviting us into your home. Um, uh, to, you know, if you've joined us via video. And uh, thank you so much for all of your kind comments and questions and interactions. We hope you will join us again for A Better Normal. We do these every Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. We typically announce them on a Monday, so I can't really give you a, an advanced heads up. You just gotta head to our website, acesconnection.com. It's a little uh, box on the right-hand side of the screen that says A Better Normal, and that's where you can find them each week and sign up. So um, we hope to see you again, and um, we hope that you will join ACES Connection. If you're not already a member, just go to our website, and click the join button. Thank you all so, so much. This will be up on our YouTube um, today. So thank you. Thank Thanks. you, Allison. Thank you all. I really appreciate it. <laughs> it was a pleasure.